In the headlines, reports suggest Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe may address the U.S. Congress when he travels to Washington later this year. Korean Americans in the U.S. are making moves to oppose the address. The worst winter seasonal yellow dust in five years blankets much of Korea with health warnings issued against the sandy and toxic wind from China. And we take a closer look at Korea's casino industry and diagnose growth points as well as risks coming from China. Hello and welcome to Adira News. Thanks for tuning in. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. We are getting reports on the growing possibility of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe addressing the U.S. Congress when he travels to Washington later this year. But Korean Americans in the U.S. are already resisting the idea, saying he needs to apologize for Tokyo's wartime atrocities first. Our Kwon Zua tells us more. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe may give a speech before U.S. Congress during his planned visit to Washington in late April or early May. Various reports say Abe has strongly expressed his will to a congressional delegation from the U.S. who recently visited Tokyo. Many U.S. congressional leaders, including House Speaker John Boehner, are known to be leaning toward letting Abe speak to Congress. If Abe gets the green light, it will mark the first time a Japanese prime minister has addressed U.S. Congress in 54 years. Former Prime Minister Hayato Ikeda was the last Japanese leader to give a speech before the House of Representatives all the way back in 1961. Before that, Nobusuke Kishi addressed Congress in 1957 and Shigeru Yoshida in 1954. Abe reportedly wants to speak before a joint session of the lower and upper house, something no Japanese prime minister has ever done before. However, some obstacles stand in his way. Many Korean Americans are opposed to Abe's move, as he's expected to promote Japan as a country that has followed a peaceful path since the end of World War II. A task force for a Korean council in Washington for women drafted for military sexual slavery by Japan said they launched a petition campaign on Sunday. They will submit a formal letter to California Congressman Ed Royce saying they are opposed to the idea unless Abe makes a sincere apology over Japan's historical wrongdoings first. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And staying with Japan, Korea has further protested Japan's latest territorial claim to Korea's Tokyo Island. The foreign ministry has summoned Kenji Kanasugi, a minister at the Japanese embassy in Seoul, to protest Japan's celebrations of its Takeshima Day. Takeshima is what Japan calls Tokyo. For the third straight year, the Japanese government dispatched a senior official to attend an event for the occasion. Seoul calls it historically regressive and questions Tokyo's willingness to strengthen ties with South Korea. Now, South Korea has reiterated its call for dialogue with North Korea just days after the regime is believed to have led live fire drills near the inter Korea maritime border. But Pyongyang says it won't sit down for talks unless Seoul calls off its upcoming joint military exercise with Washington. Our Hwang Sung tells us more. South Korea on Monday urged North Korea to drop any military provocations that could disturb peace on the Korean peninsula. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un reportedly inspected live fire drills near the inter-Korean maritime border during the Lunar New Year holiday last week. Seoul's unification ministry responded by reiterating its call for dialogue. Regardless of the current situation, we remain open to inter-Korean talks. North Korea issued a series of threats ahead of the annual joint military exercises between South Korea and the United States, scheduled for early March. The North state-run Nodong Shimun newspaper said Monday that if South Korea conducts its rehearsal for invading the North with the U.S., South Korean waters will become a site of death. Although Seoul and Washington say the drills are defensive in nature, Pyongyang views them as a practice for war. The paper reiterated that South Korea must end all military hostilities, including the upcoming exercises, if it is sincere about improving inter-Korean ties. 
North Korea has yet to accept South Korea's offer for talks made nearly two months ago. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the United States is standing by its position of seeking dialogue with North Korea while firmly responding to the regime's provocations. But North Korea watchers say issues in other parts of the world may be diverting Washington's attention away from North Korea. Choi Yoo Sun has the story. At the start of 2015, Washington slapped additional sanctions on Pyongyang for its alleged hacking of Sony pictures late last year. In a State of the Union address later in the same month, however, President Barack Obama excluded any reference to North Korea. Then came the U.S. president's controversial YouTube interview in which he said the North Korean regime will eventually collapse as the Internet penetrates further into the reclusive country. And it is very hard to sustain that kind of brutal uh, authoritarian regime uh, in this modern world. The State Department's official overseeing East Asian affairs days later said that bringing change to North Korea doesn't necessarily involve a collapse of the current leadership. The fact of the matter is we don't have a hostile policy. We have a denuclearization policy. Washington's point man in North Korea, Sung Kim, reportedly failed at a recent attempt to engage with the North in a third country. While Kim has said the U.S. has always taken a two-track approach of enforcing sanctions and keeping the door to dialogue open, it seemed odd for the administration to make such a conciliatory gesture immediately after imposing new sanctions. Analysts suggest with the latest proposal, the administration sought to hold the North accountable for the impasse rather than actually resume talks. North Korea chumming up with Russia as of late is also not a welcome development for the U.S., especially as Moscow has invited both the South and North Korean leaders to its World War II commemorative ceremony in May. And that, according to some analysts, prompted President Obama to cause a stir. All in all, crises in the Middle East and Ukraine, along with prolonged deadlock in the North Korean issue, are thought to have diverted the White House's attention away from Pyongyang. Choi yoo Son, Arirang News. The sky over much of Korea looked pretty much gray and yellow because of the fine yellow dust blowing in from China. And it's something Korea deals with pretty much every year, and it, as it poses health threats to people. Officials in Seoul have been working with authorities in Beijing to tackle this issue. Our Lee Jiun has more. It's the worst yellow dust storm in more than four years. The Korea Meteorological Administration issued yellow dust warnings in Seoul and other major cities throughout Korea this Monday morning. Every year, this unhealthy yellow haze drifts from China and Mongolia, carrying with it industrial pollutants and bacteria, none of which are good for your respiratory health. In response, weather authorities here advise people to stay indoors and wear a protective mask and goggles when going outside. But some might ask, why can't we stop the dust from drifting into Korea? What has been done to make this unwelcome guest go away? Korea and China have been working together for over a decade to fight the yellow dust. Public and private groups from both countries have been planting more trees in the deserts of China and Mongolia to slow desertification. The two countries have also established working groups to research ways to counter rising levels of dust pollution and installed high-tech air monitoring equipment. During an environment minister's meeting between China, Japan and Korea last year, the ministers talked about each other's environmental policies and agreed to work together to tackle various environmental issues with improving air quality topping the list. But experts say these efforts are being overwhelmed by China's enormous population and industries that still rely heavily on coal, leading to more air pollution. They say it's time for China to actively develop clean energy to use in place of coal and for its neighboring countries like Korea to better cooperate with China, as environmental problems like yellow dust have consequences that reach far beyond the borders of any one country. Lee Jun, Arirang News.
The Korean government is stepping up efforts to accommodate visiting Chinese tourists, including plans to build attractive resort and casino complexes. For this week's Industry Insight, our Kim ji Yeon takes a look at Korea's growing casino industry and the challenges they face, including the ones coming from China. Will the opening of resort complexes equipped with hotels, shops and casinos bring investment and boost the economy? The Korean government is betting it will. It believes it can raise 1.8 billion U.S. dollars from the casino industry. Now it's letting Korean companies get in on the bidding, a privilege once reserved for foreign investors. Just last month, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance gave the green light for the development of two additional foreigner-only casino and resort complexes in the country's free economic zones. It plans to select the two licensees by 2020. Already, the country has attracted investors for two complexes on Yeongjongdo Island, located in the western city of Incheon, the Korea-based Paradise Group and the multinational casino firm Caesars Entertainment Corporation. Both are seeking to be the Korean version of Singapore's Marina Bay Sands, which raised $5.4 billion in sales last year. But if they're to survive against the massive casino and resort complexes in Macau and Okinawa, they'll have to overcome major challenges. Currently, the Korean government bans its citizens from all casinos except one. Kawanland in northeastern Kawondo province is the only casino Korean nationals can go to. The other 16 are for foreigners only. The restriction placed on Korean nationals will affect the competitiveness of the Korean casino industry. The scale and amount of investment in the resort complexes is going to be smaller than in other neighboring countries. Korea is capping investments in its complexes at $900 million a year, a figure far below that of its rivals. There's also the China risk factor, fears that investment may turn sour depending on the number of tourists visiting Korea. Already there are signs that the Chinese government may try to restrict its nationals from gambling, both at home and abroad. Chinese President Xi Jinping has been increasing efforts to root out gambling as part of an anti-corruption campaign. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Korea's shipbuilding industry was once one of the main driving forces for the country's economic growth, but a recent OECD report says the sector is now posing a threat to the Korean economy. Our Kim Min Ji explains. Korea's shipbuilding industry is facing serious challenges to getting itself back on solid footing. This according to a recent OECD report that says the global economic crisis has dented the industry's finances. The profitability or EBITDA on sales of publicly traded Korean shipbuilders stood at around 5% in 2012, in contrast to the 11% in 2008. EBITDA refers to the earnings before the deduction of interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization expenses. The figure also falls short of the levels recorded by companies in Japan, China and Germany. The OECD report also points out that the ability of Korean shipbuilders to generate enough profit to cover their debts has declined significantly since 2007. It says while their average debt levels were less than one and a half times larger than their profit in 2007, the ratio was above six in 2012. To be financially stable, a company's debt level should not be more than three times its profit. The shipbuilders' weak performance has also led to more government involvement, with government agencies increasing their ownership role in the industry and taking on more risk. If the situation were to continue, the report warns it could have an impact on employment and the financial sector, which could result in a domino effect on the economy as a whole. In dealing with the aftermath of the crisis, the report says the government needs to maintain a level playing field between public and private entities and manage its risks. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News.
Now on to some tech news. The Mobile World Congress opens next week in Barcelona. It's one of the main places where you can catch the latest trends in telecom gadgets and technologies. Strategy Analytics has listed Samsung's latest Galaxy smartphone as one of the key gadgets to keep an eye out for. Samsung is set to uh, unveil the Galaxy S6 to the public on March 1st, a day before the official opening of the event. The research firm also says smartwatches will be hot at this year's Mobile World Congress. Samsung and LG are expected to unveil their latest smartwatches ahead of the release of the Apple Watch in April. How does the world view Korea? 60 plus years after the Korean War, there are definitely some good traits about Koreans and their society, but of course, some negative aspects as well. Our Connie Lee has her fingers on the pulse. So how do you view Koreans? A new survey of about 1,100 foreigners in Korea and abroad reveals both the good and the not-so-good perceptions of Koreans in the world. The survey, conducted by Korea's Institute for International Trade and reported by the Kyongyang Shinmun, asked foreigners for their insights. Let's take a look. First, at the good. Koreans are seen as hardworking, with more than 21% of the people surveyed saying so. Then, they're seen as kind and patriotic. On the flip side, though, a not-so-good perception of Koreans is that they're too pressed for time or rushed, while 14% see Koreans as too prideful, and 12% see them as unsociable. So if Koreans are seen this way, let's take a look at how Korean society is viewed. The survey points out the merits of Korea's good customer service, the nation's unified spirit, and Korea's dynamic social scenes. But to the bad parts of Korean society, more than 30 percent of foreigners say it's too competitive, while what they characterize as Korea's attitude of superiority is also seen as a flaw. And while the term bali bali, or quickly quickly, is emphasized here in Korea, it is also seen by the world as a negative. Connie Lee, Arirang News. A peace march in Ukraine turned deadly over the weekend. An explosion rocked the country's second biggest city, killing two people and injuring several others. And to tell us more, Paul E. is joining us from the news center. Paul, are authorities there any closer to finding out who was behind this attack? Well, Kiev's interior ministry is investigating the incident as an act of terrorism. Four suspects who were caught with a rocket launcher have been arrested. Now, the blast struck a rally that was commemorating the first anniversary of Ukraine's ousting of its pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych. Our Connie Kim has more. Unrest is spreading across Ukraine after a deadly explosion rocked the northeastern city of Kharkiv on Sunday. At least two people were killed and more than 10 were wounded in the blast at a peace rally marking one year since the uprising that ultimately toppled the Russia-backed government of Viktor Yanukovych. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko says the bombing was aimed at destabilizing the country. Our opponents, our enemies, have tried to destabilize the situation in the country. As you know, there was an act of terrorism in Kharkiv and our special security services were able to prevent an act of terrorism in Odessa. Sunday's march was to commemorate the 100 people who were killed during last February's uprising and the more than 5,000 who have lost their lives in the subsequent crisis in eastern Ukraine. Four people have been arrested in connection to the bomb attack. Kiev says all the suspects have links to Russia and received instructions and weapons from the Russian Federation. Moscow has yet to respond to the accusations. The Ukrainian government is becoming increasingly concerned that pro-Russian forces are moving beyond regions held by separatists. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second city and has been the site of violent protests by separatists over the past year. Hours prior to the explosion, the Ukrainian government and pro-Russian separatists agreed to pull back heavy military equipment this week following a deadline set during peace talks in Belarus earlier this month. Also, in the first and rare sign of progress toward implementation of the peace deal, 
The first prisoner swap of roughly 200 men took place over the weekend. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And turning now to Bangladesh, uh, the death toll from the ferry disaster over the weekend has risen to at least 70. Now, this as scores of more passengers are believed to be still missing. So, Paul, what's the latest update on the recovery operation? Well, the official search by divers at the accident site in the Panna River has been called off. The government says it will continue to monitor the area some 40 kilometers from the capital, Dhaka. Up to 140 passengers were thought to be on board the overcrowded ferry when it capsized on Sunday after being hit by a cargo ship. Police at the scene said 22 additional bodies were recovered on this Monday. More than half of the confirmed deceased were women and children. The ferry sank in the middle of the Padma River after being hit by a cargo ship while crossing the river with passengers. About 50 to 60 people could swim to the shore. Villagers also helped them. Authorities have launched an investigation to determine the cause of the capsize, with the captain and two crew members already in police custody. Mm -hmm. And uh, taking a look at uh, the financial markets, investors in Asia are keeping a close eye on Greece's uh, looming debt crisis. But it, looks, it appears for now that they're reaping the gains from a recent boost in confidence. So what's the forecast for the rest of this week? Well, Asian markets set the tone at the start of this week's trading on a mostly positive note. This as Athens hailed a last-minute deal with Eurozone finance ministers to extend a bailout agreement for the next four months. Japan's Nikkei share average hit a new 15-year high on this Monday after that breakout deal from Brussels was announced. Stocks in Hong Kong, on the other hand, lost some ground, breaking a five-day rally. Looking ahead, analysts warn that the global economy may continue to face a bumpy road. Almost certainly we're going to get volatility. The greatest near-term volatility would be if there's a risk of Greece exiting the Eurozone. That's obvious. But I would argue that actually even if Greece stays firmly locked into the Euro alongside austerity, that only increases the opportunity for massive volatility further down the line because eventually people will say no, no more of this. In the meantime, the U.S. dollar continues to surge against major currencies. It's climbed nearly 18 percent over this past year. International investors are also keeping close tabs on the U.S. Central Bank, ahead of Fed Chair Janet Yellen's Senate hearing on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And over in Hollywood, Paul, this year's Oscars ceremony has wrapped up, and the biggest names in this industry are still celebrating well into the night, I'm sure. Who came out as the big winners this year? Well, the dark comedy Birdman got about a struggling actor, got the highest recognition on Sunday, winning the Academy Award for Best Picture. Filmmaker Alejandro Inaritu also took home the award for Best Director. In his acceptance speech, he thanked the audience for watching his, quote, crazy film and dedicated the win to his fellow countrymen. I want to dedicate uh, uh, this award for, for my fellow Mexicans, uh, the ones who live in Mexico. Uh, I pray that we can uh, uh, find and build the government that we deserve, and the ones that live in this country who are part of the latest generation of immigrants in this country, I just pray that they can be treated with the same dignity and respect of the ones who came before and built this incredible immigrant nation. Thank you very much. Other top honors went to Eddie Redmayne, who won his first Oscar for Best Actor with his breakout role as British physicist Stephen Hawking in the biopic The Theory of Everything. And Julianne Moore was named Best Actress for her role in Still Alice. However, it was a disappointing night for the coming-of-age story Boyhood, which earned only one Oscar out of six nominations. Cherry? Mm -hmm. All right, Paul, uh, thank you so much uh, for those uh, stories, and we will see you again in just about two hours. And that will do it for this edition of Adira News. Thanks for watching.